It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Peter Atala, who's the CEO and, and founder, president of uh, Voxel Maps. And um, the Earth Archive is a very proud consumer of the Voxel Maps, Voxel Maps tech. And we're very excited to help in Peter's goal of creating a one-to-one -one volumetric uh, digital twin of the Earth. And I'm always a little embarrassed. Peter's such a great speaker that I'm always always a little embarrassed to um, to have to follow him, even even today. That always seems to happen. So it's never a good idea to have the uh, the opening act uh, overshadow the uh, the main act. But um, nonetheless, we'll um, we'll we'll, uh, we'll persevere on. Thanks so much, Peter. Thank you, Chris. Really, really appreciate it. You know, it's been amazing to see actually all of this come together in terms of the Earth Archive. So. I met Chris and Steve uh, probably about a year and a half ago. And just to see the work that's gone in from them, from everybody else to the first Congress has been absolutely incredible. So basically um, what, we, what we're doing really at Voxel Maps, the way I'm structuring this presentation today is the first part of the presentation is gonna be around Voxel Maps and Voxel technology, kind of a 101 on Voxels. The second part then is gonna be the application to the Earth Archive and Earth Archive data. Um, and we'll talk you know, about uh, some of these uh, really cool applications. So let's get started first with uh, what we do. So um, everything we do at Voxel is around this concept of maps for machines. And I just want to explain the difference really between human maps and machine maps. So if we look at human maps, I mean, we're pretty all familiar with these, you know, that the maps we have on our phone, they're in our cars, they're on our computers, and they're really around a use case of navigating people to addresses, you know, whether that's a city, a street, or a building, or for visualizing data. So, you know, creating some kind of geo data layers that we want to put on top. The majority of the data is really 2D. There are 3D elements, but it's not excessive, I would say, yet. And the accuracy of the data is relatively low. We're talking sort of one to three meters in terms of accuracy. What we do at Voxel is a little bit different. We're really focused on the concept of maps for machines. So here, these are true 3D spatial models. And we're analyzing every single object that we see in a given environment. So in a city, you know, that's everything from the buildings to infrastructure, telecoms, utilities. In a non-urban area, that can be vegetation and land structures or land management. And we're doing this to a really high degree of accuracy. So one to four centimeters in terms of resolution. So try imagining, you know, mapping the planet down to one centimeter resolution in 3D, it's a, it's a big job. But it's not just about the location of objects, it's also about understanding the features and the attributes. So we're pulling back measurements, other data, which is incredibly important. And when I talk about machines, I mean everything from artificial intelligent models that are there to understand cities and to understand ecology and environments, all the way through to new forms of autonomy whether that's autonomous vehicles or robots or, or drones. And there's a real requirement that this data exists everywhere, not just outdoors. So we're looking at indoor, subterranean data, even ocean data as well. So this is kind of the overall concept. Now, the goal of what we're trying to do, and when we first met the, the Earth Archive and listened to the TED Talk, um, it kind of blew us away because we were very interested in doing something very similar, but we were focused really on city and urban kind of environments. But the goal was to create a 4D volumetric twin of the, the Earth. And I'll, I, I want to take some time just to explain what I mean by that. So what do I mean by, by volumetric data? So 3D data, we've all seen. Um, this is an example. This is taken from Google Maps, but there's lots of other uh, great applications out there doing it as well. And these are really great visualization tools. They look very pretty. They're really good for humans. Um, but when you really look at them, there's not a lot of information there. And what I mean by that, the majority of the 3D objects here are empty meshes. So it's a, it's a 3D mesh uh, with something ar around it to make it look you know, very much like the object. But inherently, there's no information inside the, the structure. And you can see that when you zoom in. You know, if you zoom in, you start to see pretty low accuracy data. So again, for visualization for humans, totally you know, great solution. But for some other applications, it's not as good. And really when we're looking at say 3D meshes, what we're really doing here is if we have an object, if we have matter, we're only concerning ourselves with the surface of that matter. Whereas we all realize that matter, physical matter 
has more than surface, it has interior volume as well. And sometimes that becomes very relevant. So volumetric data is addressing that. It's creating a 3D model that addresses not just the surface data, but the interior data as well. So within the same model, you can collect, collect hyper-accurate information. For example, this is a city here being mapped to one centimeter voxels. But in, in exactly the same model, you can collect the interior space or the subterranean space. And that data will instantly drop into the model. There's no need for extensive post-processing, development of meshes, correcting textures, none of that. It, it just works. We combine this, as I said, with very high accuracy. So one to four centimeters. And we add a fourth dimension of time. And this is very important to do change detection because while it's great to have a 3D environment, all of these environments around us change. And it's important we can have the ability to model that as well. So the way that we do this is we use voxels. And I'm, I'm sure a lot of you know uh, of voxels, you've heard of voxels, but a voxel is a volumetric pixel. Essentially it's a cube. And voxels aren't new. Voxels have been around for quite a long time. For example, Minecraft is an example of a computer game that is using voxels. But voxels have already also been used in robotics. And there's areas of robotics that we were very focused on. So things around something called a VOG, a voxel occupancy grid, which typically were kind of small dynamic maps of rooms for a small robot to kind of go in and navigate their way around them. So we took that concept, but we applied it to the planet. So it's an area of technology called MRVOG, a multi-resolutional voxel occupancy grid. So we took the earth and we placed a giant mega voxel over the top of the earth. And this mega voxel is full of multi-resolutional voxels. Now, theoretically, they can be absolutely any size, but for our purposes currently, we use eight meter voxels down to one centimeter voxels. And each voxel has a permanent position in space and has a unique address. And it's what we call an, an earth-centered, earth-fixed model. So it goes straight through the planet. It's uh, subterranean, through the buildings, through the oceans, everywhere. But it's just a matrix. It's just a geo 3D, 4D georeference matrix. So what we have to do is we have to validate what we call the occupancy status of the voxel. Basically, is the voxel free space or is there matter inside it? So we do that using LiDAR. If the laser beam from the LiDAR passes through a voxel and it's not reflected off anything, it's free space. And we label it as such. But the moment that the laser beam is reflected off a, a surface, we collapse down to the smallest unit of the voxel and we label this as occupied. So in essence, we're kind of etching out the matter of the planet as we go along. And we have the ability to collect this LiDAR data in all different ways, whether we're doing that from the ground with mobile mapping or even people with, with backpacks on, all the way through to different aerial uh, you know, platforms where we collect the data. Once we've got that, the platform that we've built is a global spatial database for this 3D and 4D data. We don't believe in 3D data just being a file that you load into some kind of viewer or some kind of tool for doing analysis and then load another file up for a different area. We're, we've, what we've built here is a real-time persistent model that's designed to scale to thousands of petabytes to be able to handle planetary scale data. And that's, that's essentially what we're, we're doing. So what does this data look like? Uh, so this is just occupancy status alone. Uh, it looks really similar to a point cloud. Uh, this was collected with one of our mobile mapping sensors. Um, but this is all voxels. So these are all voxels. So with voxels, you start to have the, the shape, the measurements of everything. But on the surface of the voxels, you can put additional data layers. So for example, in cities, we very often use camera data. So we're putting the RGB values, the colors essentially on the voxels. So now you start to have something that looks more realistic to a human. But we can go beyond that. So in Unlike points or meshes, there's some really cool features really for, of the voxels. So firstly, each voxel is a volumetric measurement unit. So by default, it's very easy to perform calculations directly in the platform, as opposed to kind of transposing them into other data sets. I mentioned the surface data and you can put different types of surface data on the voxels. And that doesn't just have to be camera data in terms of RGB. It can be hyperspectral imagery. It could be radar as well. You can create the, the, the map using that. So once you have the voxels, which kind of give the shape and you have then the surface data, which in effect is color, you then apply artificial intelligent models 
uh, deep learning models that really work in 3D, it's 3D semantic segmentation. So they look at these groups of, of uh, voxels and they understand what they are. You train it to understand what it is, but not just in 3D. So every voxel has an infinite number of time states. So it has like a temporal data component. So you can get the AI to not only look at what's here at the moment, what's the current 3D picture, but if there's data for the past, you can ask it to look at the past and compare the two. So we have the ability then to do change detection, which becomes a really powerful feature. And so that when you merge that then with the addressing, with a global spatial database, with the ability to query and to search, it becomes an immensely powerful platform for all of this kind of data. So I wanna give a quick example of an urban area uh, of this data being applied, and then I'll come on to the second part of the presentation, which is really around the technology for the Earth Archive. So this is an example, this is occupancy status alone. Uh, this is downtown San Francisco in Bacadero. This is with the camera surface data layered over the voxels. And then the colors that you now see here, this is actually the AI identifying the different features that it's interested in, and then classifying them. So these different colors that have appeared is the classification of the, the AI. And then automatically from that, we have the vectorization, which gives us a lot of flexibility in the data, which means we can now play around with the data. If we want to remove features, they're gone. We can focus just on the features of the environment, whether that's city or landscape that we're interested in, or put them back. It gives us a tremendously powerful way to look at this data and manipulate this data in real time, to analyze this in real time, versus going back to point clouds and doing processing, which takes a, a long time to do that. So that's all great. I mean, I mean that's for cities, but you know, what are we doing for the Earth, Earth Archive? So we've created a partnership with the Earth Archive where we've provided the Voxel Maps platform to the Earth Archive to host, to store all of the data, to process it, and also to provide some tools um, for the community then to start using in looking at some of the problems. So this is one example. This is uh, data, aerial data that's been collected over Puerto Rico. So the data has first been voxelized. Um, and once it's voxelized, then we can apply the artificial intelligence on it so we can detect the trees, obviously. And then we're removing the trees in the tree canopy with deep learning as opposed to some of the other methods. That gives us the ground plane. Clearly it's not complete. So we reconstruct that in voxels. We can convert that to a mesh if that's uh, beneficial. And so this really helps with things like digital elevation models, you know, hydrology, soil mapping, other forms of land you know, classification. So there's lots of applications around that. But we can also go a little bit further than this as well. So we have the ability to, using deep learning, actually count the individual trees, not just the, recognize the canopy, have a look at the individual trees themselves. So for example, in this sample of data that we have, there's just over 12,000 trees. So again, this is a great technology that could be used uh, from the point of view of carbon accounting um, or even you know, forest health. And we hope to develop it that we, depending on the quality of the data, to be able to recognize individual species. So you'll be able to see some of these, uh, these important changes. Um, some applications as well for archeology span the project, uh, the Earth Archive started from that as well. So again, taking some data from the Earth Archive, uh, we have voxelized that, this is in Mexico. Again, the artificial intelligence is removing the trees. That gives us the, the landform. Uh, we reconstruct the, uh, the ground planes. And then what we've done here is we've actually trained AI to try and recognize features which we don't think are natural, which may hint that they might be arch archeological. So these objects that have just appeared have been put there automatically. It by no means is it perfect yet. It's very much in the very early stages of doing this kind of thing but it's very interesting to see how big data sets could be analyzed using this kind of technology, using these kind of tools as well. Another example uh, that I mentioned before is about change detection. Um, using same kind of data from Puerto Rico, uh, we have uh, a before and after scene. So this was actually before uh, the hurricane, Hurricane Maria, and then after the Hurricane Maria. So as well as being able to visualize the change, we can actually count what's happened. At, at the moment, you know, we've been counting trees, but in the future, be ability, we have the ability to look at damage to buildings as well, not just the removal of an object, but the damage to an object as well. So again, really, you know, interesting use cases. But the goal of what we're trying to do here with the Earth Archive is not a sales pitch. In, in fact, we're providing the platform entirely free for the Earth Archive. 
What we want to do is we want to empower the community, the Earth Archive community, to really get behind it and start to use some of these tools to go out and do some interesting things. So we have tools to automatically voxelize the data that is being provided, whether that's Earth Archive data or data that's being donated. Uh, all of the tool sets that you see will be available online, so you'll be able to access them via the web. We even have tools to train the artificial intelligent models. So in this video, there's a process called annotation. Uh, here, somebody's training uh, the, the AI to recognize trees. Um, you have the ability to do this. You could go in and find objects that you're interested in and train some deep learning uh, AI to go through, to go rapidly through data and find the objects that you're interested in as well. We even have some desktop uh, tools as well, which are more designed for research applications. And there's already a VR viewer. So if you, want, if you have a headset and you want to sit and walk through these forests uh, and see things, you can absolutely do that as well. So just looking at the future, you know, this is very much the beginning. This is the very first Congress as well. There's a lot of work to do. Mapping the planet is, is a huge, huge task. It involves partners and it involves a lot of people. Uh, but we're already looking at other forms of data. So one of the nice things, as I mentioned with the voxel model, is its multi-resolutional capability. So it's possible for us to take coarser resolution data and automatically ingest it and create these layers within the model as well. And so we're looking at satellite data, for example. In fact, Brian from NASA will, will touch on this in his uh, presentation later on. We're also looking at 4D data sets. So data sets that have been collected multiple times of the same area, that we can really start to look at change and understand what that actually means. And also, and this is a very exciting area, looking at real-time models. So with APIs, we have the ability to pull in real-time data and represent that as layers in the voxel map or as things like voxel clouds. And this example here, this, this uh, image here is actually 5G signal strength in a city uh, that's been collected as a 4D data set and visualized as a cloud of voxels moving through a city. We can actually see the impact buildings have and actually track it even inside the buildings as well. So that kind of maybe climate data, maybe other forms of data that might be uh, real time or near to real time could be really interesting. But as I mentioned, this is the beginning and we need your help. So we can't do all of this by, by ourselves. And, and today I wanna make kind of a call out to, to people that might be interested in both the Earth Archive and this kind of technology. We're looking for interesting scientific questions. You know, the big questions or the areas of interest where maybe this data could be applied to or these tools could be applied to. And around those questions, we want to create working groups of scientists, academics, volunteers that can devote some of their time to working out how we would go about trying to solve these problems or answer these questions. And from that, we want to create these challenges. And so the challenges will look at, can we answer some of these questions with this data? with these tools? Or can we provide insight which could be valuable? So as I said, this is very much the beginning of the journey. Uh, you know, I, I hope at the next Congress we'll have some great um, use cases and some challenges that we've been able to do with uh, teams of people from around the world. Uh, but we're super excited to be part of it. And um, yeah, if, I'd be very happy to answer any questions if we have time. If not, please feel free to, uh, to reach out to me um, afterwards. Be very happy to carry on the conversation. Well, I hadn't seen that uh, <laughs> second half of that. So I'm trying to, um, that was amazing. I'm trying to digest that. That actually was uh, the site of Angamuco in, in Michoacan, Mexico, central Mexico. And that was a, a pyramid and, and um, two walls and an altar that, uh, that the AI um, identified. And I think if we uh, play with that, um, we'll be able to pick out, uh, there, there are probably four or 5,000 building foundations in that, that little yeah, tile it, alone. And we'll probably be able to pick out like, um, uh, a lot more of them. So I, now, so I'm going to have to, um, I'm gonna have to think, I'm going to, now I have to think about that. Peter. Yeah. Sorry, Kurt, I should have shown you this, this before, but it was, now, it was now, very, it's not perfect by any means, but you know, it's now, a beginning and it's, it yeah. shows promise. So, now I'm incredibly, uh, incredibly distracted, but we do have time for like one, maybe one question. So uh, how do you generate your DL training sets? So the, so we collect the data ourselves. So actually back here, if we're looking at this, uh, 
this training set. In the city environment, we actually have our own vehicles that are driving around uh, the, the, the world, essentially, at the moment. Uh, we collect uh, for different customers about a million kilometers of data uh, a, a year at the moment. So it's pretty big in terms of the scale. And so once we take that, that data in, we actually train ourselves. We have teams that will go through and annotate. And as I said, the annotation is in 3D. It's not a 2D semantic image uh, you know, uh, that we're doing. It's a full 3D voxel annotation as well. Um, so we, we annotate currently in cities, we're recognizing around 90 objects or so. Um, and we've just really started in the ecology space and some of the archeology span stuff as well. Um, and so that annotation process is one of the things that we really feel the Earth Archive community could be really great at. If there's objects they're interested in, we can give them the tools to, to train the AI and then see the results. That would be, be really exciting to see.